the same if you're a, a, you know, a manic depressive. You, you have a manic episode, you have a depressive. When you're depressed and you think, you cannot conceive of such a thing as the future. Life is so black, you cannot imagine a tomorrow. Just everything is just awful. Your energy is slow and there's nothing possible in life. It's terrible. It's actually painful. It's bad, really bad. It can be, for some people, it's so bad that they really have to end their lives in some way. They feel it anyway. But the fact is, it will come out. And in the case of a bipolar person, it won't just be normal, it'll then go super normal. It will become incredibly sunny. And rather than having no sense of the future, you plan for a hundred futures. You are so excited with the possibility of what you can do in this world, with your creative power, with your um, entrepreneurial ideas. Your grandiosity knows no bounds. It's an extraordinary feeling. Terrible for people around you. But you know, I asked everybody I spoke to, if there was a button, and they could press the button, and they would no longer be, you know, manic depressives, they would no longer have this bipolar disorder, would they press the button? And only about two said yes, because that manic state is a thing to be treasured sometimes. I mean... And is that true for you? Yes, it is. I'm very lucky. I have really what they call cyclothymia. It's, 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 in America they call it bipolar light. <laughs> it is, a, <laughs> it, it is a, more, a more manageable version. Um, and... Uh, but it does have its bad moments. But, but you, you know, I spoke to people who had taken electric drills to their brain to kill themselves. I, I, I spoke to a man who was really extraordinary, called Rod, Rod Harvey. He had been a commander in the, in the Royal Navy. He'd actually had a position on the Royal Yacht Britannia, as it happens, with the, you know, which the Queen and the Royal Family used to have as their yacht. And he was a charming and splendid, uh, promising officer. And he, he developed this condition. It became very, very bad. He had to leave the Navy. Then he couldn't hold down a job. Well, at one point, he was in a, uh, in a hospital being looked after. And his depression was so black, he got up, was supposed to have some security, but he short-circuited it. And he walked in front of a lorry. And he smashed both his legs. Now, he's the first to say, well, how could I do that to the lorry driver? For one thing, it's terrible. And he shows me his legs. That, that he can walk. They slowly, with the number of you know, the number of times they had to re-break them, set in metal. I said, the agony of both your legs. You could see the scars on it. He said, yes, but do you want to know something? It was nothing like as terrible as the pain that made me stand in front of that lorry. Mm. And that's the thing you have to understand with, with that kind of depression. It is not just oh, snap out of it. You know, things will get better. Look on the bright side. It is an illness. It is a real physical descent of something quite terrible into people's minds. And, and if you say to someone, I'm asthmatic or I'm diabetic, they don't go, oh, yeah, oh, oh goodness. But if you say, I'm, 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 I'm bipolar, there is a little look that can flicker in their eyes, and it's tricky. Not in Hollywood, of course. I, um, <laughs> I interviewed... <laughs> I interviewed my good friend Carrie Fisher, who you may remember as Princess Leah, yes. uh, the daughter of Debbie Reynolds, wonderful, amazing person. And she describes herself as the poster child for full bipolar. Uh, it is sort of ironic because she's had a very tough and extraordinary life, as you'll know if you've seen or, seen or read Postcards from the Edge. But she said, um, she said, Stephen, you've got it all. I said, what do you mean? She said, gay, Jewish, and bipolar. You, how can you <laughs> fail in Hollywood? <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I wonder if it was some, I think you said once that um, you could never live suburb in suburbia because the sound of sprinklers brings you out in hives. <laughs> yes. Well, it's a kind of shorthand for me, sprinklers or, you know, I, I'm lucky to think, essentially, I've never in my life since I was a child when my father made me, I've never had to handle a lawnmower. Um, <laughs> and a lawnmower to me is a symbol of something. And, and, and maybe... Oscar Wilde is a good place to go here because when I was, was first became sort of well known, I used to go to you know universities would ask me to give a talk here or do a debate there or something or other, uh, um, you know, talk to a media studies, you know, the way that they, they might. And, and occasionally you get asked uh, if you were staying in the university town, you get asked to you know have a drink in you know, people's rooms and so on. I don't mean anything salacious here. Either. And and when I was a student and right up through, through the early 80s maybe you would see the standard student posters. You'd see Che Guevara, Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon maybe, posters of them. Because revolutionary politics and rock and roll were going to change the world. Mm. But as the 80s turned into the 90s, I noticed that these posters were replaced by principally two other people. Partly because the death of Lennon, the stifling kind of 
you know, ossification of pop music, the commercialization of it, the further commercialization of it, and the falling of the Berlin Wall, the clear betrayal that communism had made of any hope to be thought of as the friend of the working classes and the liberator of the oppressed. Actually, I started to see more and more posters of Albert Einstein and Oscar Wilde. And it's as if the student generation realized that, that freedom and the future lay in the mind. Wilde said, if you want to be a grocer or a general or a politician or a judge, you will invariably become it. That is your punishment. <laughs> if, if you never know what you want to be, if you live what some might call the dynamic life, but I will call the artistic life, if each day you are unsure of who you are and what you know, you will never become anything, and that is your reward. We, before um, you arrived uh, in Australia yesterday, um, contacted some members of the Twitterverse. Oh, and we s invited them to send in some questions. Okay. Okay. Two internet questions, because the first, which I just thought was very funny, from uh, Steph Claire Noir. Would you like a Tim Tam? Do you have an answer? <laughs> I, if, if someone can explain to me what a Tim Tam is, I'm almost... <laughs> Show Is it like a violet crumble? <laughs> it's like Milo in a biscuit. Um, oh, I'm so ashamed. Of another. Not, but I, I have had a violet crumble, if that's any use. That's very good. Um, we are running very short of time, but you, I believe, are the last surviving man who knows the answer to why 42. Douglas Adams' explanation for... It's the a, life, the universe, yeah. and everything. So what is it? It's, it's, Share. Uh, it's really wonderful. The, um, you know, the last time, it's almost as if my dear darling friend Douglas, who died so, so sadly early, he was an extraordinary and a wonderful man, and I could devote an evening just to talking about Douglas, but it, it's almost sometimes, I think, as if he's, um, he's in the room when I, uh, when I talk about this answer to 42, which he did vouchsafe me. Um, because the last time I announced the reason for it, um, the, the, the microphone went dead. And if it was to happen again, we would be in real trouble. But the, the simple reason why 42 is that... <laughs> that simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Final, final Twitter question, which comes from Warp975. Right. <laughs> Will you accept the role, Stephen Fry, of our Lord and Master? <laughs> <laughs> oh, very well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks, Stephen Fry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're yeah, the best of it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You're very lovely. Thank you so much. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? Is that for me? <laughs> wow, thanks. You can pre-order the DVD of Stephen Fry live at the Sydney Opera House at ABC Shops or online. Next week, the famous Belgian detective returns as David Suchet stars in Poirot, next Sunday night on ABC One.